Hi friends, this is John. I'm passionate about developing regenerative agriculture systems that improve soil health, produce crops that are completely resistant to diseases and insects, and produce food of such an exceptional quality that we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. I've been fortunate to meet many people with incredible knowledge and information about soil and plant systems. However, much of this knowledge and information is scattered all over the place. There are many incredible stories and a lot of knowledge that have not been widely shared. I founded Advancing Eco Agriculture in 2006 to bring this knowledge together in a more coherent fashion and incorporate it into products and growing systems that growers can easily put into practice. It's my personal mission to have these regenerative agriculture systems become the mainstream globally, the status quo against which all other growing systems are compared. To achieve this goal, I want to share the knowledge that we have learned in the last decade and make it available to everyone. These concepts and principles about regenerative systems can be applied anywhere, and when they're properly applied, they will increase farm profitability and resilience to climate stress. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, or topics of ideas that you would like for me to discuss, please connect on social media or email me, john at regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com. Be sure to sign up for our email list at regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com. Hope you enjoy, and thank you for listening. Hi, friends. Welcome to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. I'm back with Gary Zimmer for the second time. Gary is the first consultant that we've hosted twice in a row. Gary's had a lot of thoughts and insights that we wanted to follow up on and get into some more detail. Pleasure to be here. And uh, yes, we talked about some different topics and things. And I look forward to it. I've been doing some thinking and searching and hopefully we can share some information here of my life experiences. Gary, one of the pieces that we spoke of a little bit, and this is fresh on my mind because um, I I had a webinar last night where I got onto a soapbox a little bit. It was nitrogen management and some of the challenges and the opportunities with nitrogen management today and ways that we can improve it. What have you learned regarding nitrogen management and, and how we can do it better? So first, I, I always start out and I tell farmers that I don't know if they all realize that nitrogen is a necessary evil, but it's, it also can cause a lot of trouble. If we go way back into the uh, early years when everybody started growing corn and they started using nitrogen and the volume of residues grew twice as big. They said, man, this is going to be great. We're really going to grow organic matter now. Well, 50 years later, guess what? It went down. So excess nitrogen is always an issue out here and they always blame tillage. But now even with no-till and excess nitrogen, you burn up carbon. So you're always balancing that carbon to nitrogen kind of a situation. So uh, my whole thing on nitrogen is this. I think we can get people if the recommendations are 1.1 pounds of nitrogen per bushel of corn. Let's just pick on corn. I would say that we ought to be able to get that down to 0.5 where a lot of people function. In order to do that, there is a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere. There is a biological link. And uh, they all like to talk about nitrogen credits, whether they be from a legume or a soybean or whatever they're from. And I like to talk about the fact that let's put in the term digestibility and solubility. Because, you see, um, I was at a conference in Pennsylvania a couple of years back, and they had grown hairy vetch, and it was huge, and it was rank, and they said, we got all these nitrogen credits, and the corn was sick and yellow. And they said, we don't understand, we got all these nitrogen credits. And next to it, they had a plot where they had clover and alfalfa that they had worked down, it was only a foot tall, and it was lush and green, and that corn was absolutely beautiful, but it had a lot less nitrogen credits. So what's going on is the term digestibility. Of course, being a dairy nutritionist, treating soil like treating cows is a reality. And so I said, you took that pure, mature crop of vetch, ripe seeds and everything in it, and you fed it to a dairy cow, how much milk would you get? Not very much. Although you got a pile of nitrogen, it's not digestible. The young succulent clover was digestible. So I think that's a huge part of nitrogen management. Previous crops, that's why if it's corn on corn and you got corn stalks, not only don't you have something that's highly digestible, you don't have a very big nitrogen base. And so that's why starting that pre-digestion a little bit earlier. So what this digestibility really is, is about managing biology. Bugs that eat that young succulent clover and alfalfa are not the same ones that eat that mature rank thing. It's, it's a whole lot easier to digest something that's soluble than something that's complex carbons. And that's all a part of nitrogen management. So I tell people, first, you got to get beyond the fact that it's a numbers game. It's not so many pounds of nitrogen so much. as I've seen some pretty incredible crops growing with pretty low levels of purchased nitrogen. Nobody grew it without nitrogen. 
They grew it without purchased nitrogen. There's a huge difference. And so my whole thing is this, that uh, as time goes on, because we farm organically, we actually do soil nitrogen tests and we look at how we manage the cover crops. And we always say, you've got to have a beautiful, lush, high digestible, high kind of a nitrogen cover crop. It could even be a grass as long as it's lush and taken down at the right stage. There's a lot of milk produced on high digestible grasses. First, you got to get that. If you don't have that good stand, then how do you back down on nitrogen? And I think there's now a couple of people out here, scientific researchers, some with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and one from Australia, that are now convinced that as time goes on, once you start backing off of this soluble nitrogen thing, you'll start to have more biology build up in the soil that actually can pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Can we propagate that? It's almost like saying if I put a lot of nitrogen in front of an alfalfa or a soybean crop, will I get as many nodules? I think there's pretty good evidence that you won't because the plant determines the soil life and there's a bath of nitrogen and they don't get it. So this whole nitrogen management thing, I think, gets down to our biology is the link and we can actually grow more nitrogen. That's the only thing we can grow. Other inputs need to be provided and we got to have these beautiful, healthy soils that got to be fed and fed the kind of materials that digest well and give us out nitrogen. Now, going through that all, how does a farmer deal with that? We'll just talk conventional. There's a lot of guys go into the organic world and they want to buy chicken manure or something because they think they got to put pound per pound worth of nitrogen on here, and I don't think they really understand that well enough. Well, let's just talk about a conventional one. My thought would be on a conventional farm that best way to be is whatever we got for our little starters or stuff we put out there in the beginning, and depending upon the previous crop and whatnot, I would start out by side dressing my nitrogen. I want to be able to split my nitrogen. And I tell farmers, nitrogen is the easiest thing in the world. If you're conventional and we're back on corn again, and I got whatever I start out with, and then I want to come along and side dress some, and hopefully if I got good enough and big enough equipment, I can side dress it even later season, I can vary my rates. I can test out what my farm, how it responds to nitrogen. Understanding that the longer I'm at this, that's why I can't do it just once and say, oh, my farm needs 30 gallons at 32% or whatever, is to say, I got to constantly keep testing it because as time goes on and my soils get better because I want to use as little as possible and I want to put it when and where I need it and I want to use it for a purpose. So splitting the nitrogen and then I'd like to add a carbon to it. So our whole preferred thing is we like our molasses or I could put a humate. I want to put something to kind of buffer it out. If I was going to use it dry, I would use some ammonium sulfate. Possibly some, uh, we use ESN, environmentally smart, that polymer-coated nitrogen on a lot of our conventional farms. Or I would use uh, sulfur because sulfur can replace part of our nitrogen. So this whole nitrogen thing, I think, can be made simpler, although I went through this maybe too fast. But it it, it can also be uh, fairly simple out here on this thing. Just like we had this meeting the other day, and this guy's a hog farmer. And uh, he keeps getting a response from putting on more nitrogen. I finally said to the guys, you know, maybe it's not the nitrogen. Maybe it's the carbon dioxide that's giving him a response. Exactly. So when he puts on this extra nitrogen, later in the season, he's still got residues. You know, that Francis Childs, the first guy to grow that 400 bushel corn, what did he say? In order to grow 400 bushel corn, you probably should follow 400 bushel corn because you need those residues for the carbon dioxide release. What are your thoughts on that? I, I couldn't agree more. I uh, I still see farmers applying nitrogen in the fall. And that to me is, I'm just going to say exactly what I think about it. That is dumb. That's the dumbest thing. I, I, I cannot see that making agronomic sense from any perspective, no matter how you look at it. And I was thinking about this to a grower and I, got, I was asked the question as well, well, then why do we get such a big response from nitrogen applications? I believe a large part of it is coming from the carbon dioxide, from the CO2 response, because nitrogen is going to solubilize our organic matter, which going back to a point that you made at the beginning is why, why have we lost organic matter with continued increased nitrogen applications over the last 50 years? Yeah. Because Roy's balance that carbon to nitrogen ratio, that basis. And the other thing is when the guy puts that nitrogen on the fall, and I don't disagree with you, and I struggled with this one for a little while, because where I say, well, let's, if, let's say you're growing corn on corn. Let's start the digestion process, because if I can get that digested down, I cut down on my disease and insects. I said, but you're boiling carbon dioxide off into the atmosphere, and there's no plant to absorb it. And if you want to drive your higher yields, you want to save all the carbon you can to release it during the growing season when the corn needs all that carbon dioxide. 
but putting a little bit, like we're saying, even if it's a light coat of manure or maybe only you know, 10, 15 units of nitrogen, we like to maybe add a biological to it. Maybe we'd add a little sugars to it with our molasses, and we'd spray that on those corn stalks right behind the harvest and lightly work them in the ground so the digestion process starts. And then the carbon and a little bit of nitrogen we add can go into bodies of bugs, and it's not really a boil off of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's different from applying 100 pounds of nitrogen in the fall. Yes. And I think the other thing on this, that's why nitrogen is such a, it's not, that's why it's not a numbers game. I tell people, just think, if you farm every year, it should get better. And once you get down to having a huge population of earthworms doing all that digestion, they're 72% protein, they're 11% nitrogen. Uh, our numbers that I read, and I don't know how accurate, maybe someone's going to argue with the scientific behind it, but uh, 25 worms in a cubic foot, we always said is, is uh, 80 units of nitrogen, just some old dead nine worms if they're there throughout the season. So now how do you put that in your formula? Exactly. And so you've mentioned that comment a couple of times that a pound of nitrogen is not a pound of nitrogen is not all the same. And this is something that we've observed as well is that there's this idea that it takes so many units of nitrogen to grow a bushel of grain crop. And yet we sometimes see pretty extraordinary yields with sustained nitrogen levels in the soil without those volumes of nitrogen application or even those volumes of nitrogen credits showing up. How does that work? Yeah, and that's exactly right. And it's because there's this biology link and we're getting it there. And this, someone said, well, if I build my organic matter, I'll get more nitrogen release. I said, well, you know, that might be a 10-year project. And we can have responses really quick because we just transitioned some more land organically. Now we grew oats. We left the straw out there. We underseeded with clover and, and alfalfa. We did it two years in a row. So last year we worked that all back in. And just like people put on manure and they said, well, you only can count 40% of the credits for your nitrogen on that manure. I said, what if I did it three years in a row? So last year we put the cover crop back in the ground along with the straw, which would help build up my organic matters in my soil possibly, or at least gives me more fiber structural things to help improve my soil structure. Now we do it again this year. And then that clover and everything is out there right now. We'll mow it down this fall. Next spring when that gets a foot tall, we'll lightly work that in. I'm a real believer in my shallow incorporating. And then we'll plant the crop. So how much nitrogen have I really built? Some came from last year. Some came from this year. I got some older stuff and I got some fresh succulent stuff I'm breaking down. So I got a, almost a time release nitrogen. Now, we probably will put a little dairy manure on because we're a dairy farm. But we will not see any issues that I know of that we'll, we never see yellowing corn. We never see nitrogen is not our limiting factor. That's one of the pieces that we've observed as well. Is I, I can't even begin to describe how many farms we begin working with. And of course, we're working with sap analysis. We start working with sap analysis and the plants tell us and the sap analysis and the lower older leaves that they don't need more nitrogen. In many cases, after we've cut nitrogen applications by anywhere from 30 to 60 percent, huge numbers where we're dramatically reducing nitrogen applications. Mm -hmm. And I think this, this goes to atmospheric nitrogen fixation and the fact that that might not happen as well if you apply a lot of nitrogen up front. So I guess the question that I have in that for you is what have you observed or what have you experienced with atmospheric nitrogen absorption? Well, and that's, like I said, it's a hard one. And I'm totally convinced that there's certain organisms that this whole system was designed to work fairly well in the beginning. There's certain opportunities that the plants determine soil life. And if they need more nitrogen out here, there are certain organisms that are going to rise to the occasion, especially if we got a base of carbon to digest from. Now, that all takes time. But as time goes on, my observations were that our need for nitrogen also goes down. We actually cleared some land that was in Christmas trees, which was uh, 20-year-old pine trees. And so there's nothing been grown on it for a long period of time. And, and it was already could be certified organic. And so we actually put a fair bit of manure out there and grow corn. And guess what happened? It turned yellow. Now, the bottom ends, it wasn't a disaster, but uh, even putting on manure or nitrogen, but I guarantee you by next year or the year after, give us three years and that'll all go away. So what happened? We had to change the biology, had to rise to the occasion to fill in the gap that right now we don't have enough exchangeable nitrogen. One of the pieces that I see being important to build exchangeable nitrogen, which you mentioned, is that we talk about building biology, but we also have to build a food source for that biology, which is not just nitrogen, but really the soluble carbon, digestible carbon, which you referenced a couple of times. Mm -hmm. The two go together. Yep, that makes, uh, yeah, that's why it's perfect sense. So I go back and I tell the farmers, it's really quite simple to manage nitrogen. You treat a crop that needs nitrogen like you treat a cow given 100 pounds of milk. If you're not a dairy nutritionist, 
those guys pretty well got it figured out what kind of feed you got to feed that cow. Just go search it out. And if you want to grow a legume or a soybean crop, you feed that like you feed a dry cow or an old beef cow. You just kind of keep it around and keeping it alive. And you let you use less soluble nutrients because you don't want that animal to have all this gain and excess energy and digestibility and protein. If she's just uh, not performing well. So I think if we put that mindset onto the soils and look at them, whether it's a grass or a legume, I don't really care as much as I do that digestibility. But this is the hardest topic to get across to farmers. They just don't care. They have a really hard time grasping this thing. And I think it's common sense. And it's so much fun when it starts working. Yes, it sure is. It sure is. Let's talk a little bit about nuts actual nitrogen applications on commercial farms. You mentioned stabilizing nitrogen by adding carbon, by adding sulfur, perhaps using ammonium sulfate. Um, what are some of the common tools that you use to stabilize nitrogen applications to make sure we, we get the greatest crop response? So first of all, if we go to a farmer and they've been just putting on, whether it be urea or even in some anhydrous, we pretty well don't work with too many that do that, but there's always a few that are hard to wean. And uh, uh, if they all say they're just using nitrogen, the first thing we want to do, because ammonium sulfate is more of a slow release, time release, there's some carbon with it. We tell them that you can replace 25 units of your nitrogen right up front by using sulfur. Uh, both nitrogen and sulfur have a similar effect. They have that greening effect on plants. And so whether that's all 100% scientifically in line with what people think, but we're pretty well convinced that if a guy's putting on straight urea, and if I take out... Uh, 100 pounds of urea, which is 46 units of nitrogen, and I put in ammonium sulfate, which if you add the nitrogen and sulfur together, it's 45, 21 of nitrogen and 24 of sulfur. So we treat those first 100 pounds of ammonium sulfate as we would 100 pounds of urea, and we just switch. So now we've reduced this nitrogen, but we haven't really induced any effect yet. So then uh, how do I make urea more stable? That's, that's why we struggle with that one a little bit. So I like to use a little, our, our upfront nitrogen, preferably is, is ammonium sulfate. If a farmer is not set up to come back and side dress or do some of the other things we'd like to do, then we use the ESN, and that's that polymer coated urea because that gives us a bigger time release because we're trying to get, I don't want to bathe that thing with nitrogen up front. Our preferred thing, come back and side dressed, and uh, uh, we make a molasses product called Boost, which is really, uh, it's got a lot of sugars in it, but molasses and there's some other things in it, some yeast and stuff to help stabilize that. So I'm not one that wants to put an inhibitor in my nitrogen because it doesn't just inhibit that nitrogen transition. All these chemistries that we add to the soil have a, other side effects. It's just, uh, it's more to it than, oh, I'm just going to slow my nitrogen release because it's an antibiotic. I'm uncomfortable with those. I'd rather put in, I could do uh, some humic acid. I could put in something that's going to give that nitrogen something to bind to. Now, the sugars don't perform like the humic acids. The humic acids, in my opinion, are a sponge and a holder of nitrogen, whereas uh, molasses is actually a feeder of biology, and I'm trying and putting a sugar, it's kind of buffering it, but I'm trying to get that nitrogen as fast as I can into the bodies of bugs. And so then I got it stabilized in a carbon biological cycle. And then, of course, we always add some thiosulfate and make sure we got a little sulfur because that helps stabilize that nitrogen. And then putting on both sides of the row, splitting it out a couple of times is certainly well. You've seen a lot of farmers now set up to do that, having high boys and going in their late season with their wide drops or whatever they do to put on a little extra nitrogen is a way that we can get most efficient because they're all worried, oh, if I don't put a lot on early, it's going to get away from me and I'll miss it. So I think we got tools and equipment to be able to do that. Depends on how the farm is set up. So I don't know if you have other things besides the, the sugars and the humics that you would add to nitrogen, but that's kind of the camp that we stick in. I think doing nitrogen applications later when the plants are taller just makes very good agronomic sense, almost irregardless of what you're describing, because how much nitrogen does a six inch tall corn plant really actually need? Yep. And then I tell everybody my story about uh, plants and life is this, everything is basically lazy. And so what'll happen, we get all that nitrogen on, we get this big top lush green growth, but the roots got lazy because all the nutrients were soluble and they were stuck right next to that poor little plant. So later on, when it runs out, he hasn't built the root base and we may have burned up some of that carbon we, did, we wanted to save to later, but they haven't really set themselves up for what's coming because they have no idea. They say, wow, this is the way the world is. I don't need to grow that bigger, that bigger, better root system so I can tap into more things. And uh, so that, that big old root system now, the plant puts its exudates in the soil and is, again, feeding bacteria, which we should be able to scrounge and get more nitrogen availability. 
and there's not only there's not only the root system effect, but also the effect on biology, which you mentioned earlier, is that when in the case of nitrogen application, you may not get legume nodulation. And I think the same thing happens with um, Azotobacter and other bacteria that are known to have the capacity to fix atmospheric nitrogen. Yes. That isn't likely to happen in an environment where there is already an overabundant supply of nitrogen that is going to suppress biology. Yep. That's exactly the way we feel about it also. Yeah, and and to your uh, to your earlier question about um, we, we also use and make recommendations for um, sulfur using lots of uh, thiosol in, in liquid nitrogen applications and humic acids. We typically use humic acids at about three percent of the solution, mm -hmm. and we find that that's enough to really hold and stabilize the nitrogen. Yes, and so on. yeah, and we will actually because uh, obviously in the molasses we tell the farmers. It's an easy way to do. Instead of side dressing, thirty-two uh, percent, we'll take if they're putting on twenty gallons. We like to take, we like to treat the solution and take out ten percent. Now that that's about a thirty percent sugar kind of a thing in that molasses. Because there's other things in this water, so we actually tell the farmers if you're set up to side dress thirty gallons of nitrogen, that's what you're going to do. Take out ten percent of that solution and put ten percent of this boost molasses mix in, and you'll achieve. We've all, now we reduced your nitrogen a little bit. We've never seen anybody go backwards doing on doing that. And a lot of times they'll move forward because now we've actually done we've done them a favor and we actually started reducing his nitrogen. Exactly. Have you uh, have you used any molybdenum with the side dress, or have you are you looking at molybdenum at all for the effect that it can have on nitrogen in the plant? As a company, we don't really distribute and work with molybdenum. Now, years ago, I put a lot of work and effort into it on molybdenum, and of course. Products like that uh, Idaho phosphate are that we've been marketing. Now everybody doesn't use as a pretty good source of living. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. I think uh, to me the future lies in what we're doing out here. These guys, so instead of putting a starter fertilizer down that row that's got just N, P, and K in it, it's going to have that little cholesterol mix like I talk about. It's going to have root stimulants. It's going to have some maybe some kelp in it. It's going to have some maybe some sugars in it. It's going to maybe have in some plant compounds and maybe some of these very unique compounds like molybdenum and things belong because uh, I got such a small amount do they belong in that little trench when I'm starting that thing out some root plant protective kind of compounds I think we can do more in that root zone at planting or that little cluster mix zone and uh, but as a company we have not moved into that category and now we do use a lot of natural mined materials for our fertilizers which some of them have some of those rare kind of minerals in them and I know one of our topics we're going to talk about was trace minerals. See, because uh, if you look at the earth and what's been marketed, whether the companies are real or not, within the we years ago, we had planters and long fossils, and we had uh, all these different compounds, sulfur plus, I don't know, zeolites are a little bit different, but these mined materials, there's certain mines out here that people search for to find those little rare, what, what's in there after? Maybe it's some of those little rare minerals. Is it molybdenum? Do you actually add it on your guys into the fertilizer mixes? We do, and we've observed this very interesting effect uh, when we're looking at sap analysis. We've observed that there is this trio of three different nutrients, magnesium and sulfur and molybdenum. Uh, when we look at plant saps, we're measuring, we measure ammonium and we measure nitrate and we measure total nitrogen. And our desire, our goal from a plant health perspective is to have an adequate or a generous supply of total nitrogen with a non-detectable on nitrate and ammonium. We want those numbers to be zero. Wow. We can get there very reliably when we have magnesium and sulfur and molybdenum, all three at adequate levels. But if one of them is missing, nitrate levels go up. Hmm. Of course, it's always difficult. It's a juggling act to get all that exact into that plant. And I guess that's where you've got to recognize that a lot of the farmers we work with are... Uh, I don't want to, I'm not being critical. I think I'm saying they're in kindergarten as far as understanding all these things. If we can just get them to run a better sources of minerals and look at a few more things and do just a few of these practices, like even putting a cover crop in, is a giant step forward. So whether we take it to this level or not, I think it's going to go there eventually, and I respect what you're all trying to do. But uh, I think for the base of the customers we work with, that, that might be a little more shocking than they can tolerate. <laughs> So we've been talking about nitrogen management, and uh, a few moments ago, we were describing humic substances. One of the pieces that you and I spoke about in our prior conversation was the idea of delivering nutrients much more efficiently and much more effectively using carbon-based fertilizers. 
And I think this ties in directly to the, our nitrogen management conversation because really what we're talking about is the need to have a balanced carbon to nitrogen ratio in the soil profile and to hold that and stabilize it and, and keep the plant available. And how, how does that concept of carbon stabilizing nutrients transfer to other nutrients in addition to nitrogen? How do you utilize that? Yes, and I think back to my little word of digestibility, that carbon to nitrogen thing, and, and we're saying that, see, in order to have the biology really do its work and break it down, trace minerals, so what about all the other minerals, and how do we get them available? Some of them are just like that molybdenum. They're pretty small additions. So how do we take that addition in very small amounts and make sure we can actually get it plant active and plant available? And so uh, balancing carbon and nitrogen and just burning up all my carbon, those nutrients then get lost or mixed or tied up or hooked somewhere. So that's the whole other thing with carbon. I like that whether it be within a plant, let's say I just put some of this stuff out there and grow a plant and then manage the digestibility of that plant, I'm now going to be more time released and I'm going to be distributed better. We had a farmer the other day was asking uh, if he's growing his cover crop now, if he should put trace minerals on it. I said, a cover crop is not a cover. It's not covering anything. It's actually a crop that you're using to distribute minerals for the next crop. And you're going to manage it accordingly. So that nitrogen to carbon ratio comes in line in terms of digestibility. If I'm way too high in carbon and low on nitrogen, it's going to take a long time to break down. I can set myself up for disease and insects, and I don't get my availability of my minerals. So if I get that high level of mineral uptake, see, me as a dairy nutritionist, that's how I got introduced to some of these things way back 40 years ago, was to create better feed for cows. When we started, I spent nine years at the university balancing rations based on a set of numbers. If you turn to get better digestible feed and the mineral levels in that feed are higher, that high digestible feed might have 95% of that mineral available to the cow. The stuff you buy in stones and bags might only be 40% available. So that's why we, so when we quit, when we started balancing rations to cows, I think it's the same thing with soils. We'd say, look, once you start getting this high mineralized digestible and you're managing that digestible of those feeds, you can actually cheat on numbers and cut down what you apply by at least 25%. So they would back off that ration numbers with a lot of success once they started getting this minerals mixed in high digestible feed. So in the soil, it would work the same way. That was why it takes several years to really get this thing to crank out to the level. I know for us as an organic farmer, the two years in transition from conventional to organic, all we do is remineralize and grow cover crops to get that soil built up. So when it is organic, it's always some perfect, but we started this whole thing about getting a higher nutrient exchange, but it's all based on first getting them out there and then getting them in a form where they go through their carbon biological cycles with plants and biology. Essentially, Gary, what you're describing is farmers should grow their cover crops as a ration for soil biology, similar to growing a ration for rumen biology. So in saying that, do you believe that farmers should manage their cover crops as, as carefully and as well as they do their actual crops that they're growing? Yes, I think those cover crops need to be treated as uh, they are my reserve to hold and release the kind of minerals that I want to release. And so then uh, this guy the other day, he said, why don't, you know, I like using my homogenized trace minerals. He said, why well, don't have those available? He said, what if I went and just sprayed some on my cover crop? And I said, well, you know, obviously whether they get absorbed or where they go, I think that's certainly not a bad idea. And then he said, well, can I use a cheaper source of those? And I said, well, they still got to be able to get into the plant. And I'm not sure. How, we like our sulfate trace minerals or our chelates. I'm not sure how that would really work. But it starts that process. The last thing I want them to do is spend money and buy something and dump it on the land and just another stone added to another big pile of stuff that we already got laying in our soil. Yeah, exactly. What I can say is... What we have observed is our most successful growers, those who have regenerated soil health the most rapidly and have achieved the greatest crop responses, manage their cover crops as carefully as they do their crops. And they'll use foliar sprays, they will put on fertilizers, they will manage those crops as well as they do the crops that they're actually harvesting. Yep, I'm 100% in agreement with that. That's what I tell people, I was just at some farms and they had some really poor stands of alfalfa and their cover crops were half a stand and they said, we're not getting a success. I said, but you don't really have a very good cover crop or a very good alfalfa stand to work back into the ground to feed the soil. If your stand of alfalfa is half gone, so obviously you're not going to get all the benefits. I think you're absolutely right. I think that's a huge ticket to using cover crops 
or even our rotation. See, we, uh, as a dairy farm, we only leave our alfalfa in one or two years. We we like to take that beautiful, lush stand of alfalfa grasses and, and let it get up to that high digestible stage and work it back in the soil. And everybody says, oh, my gosh, I could feed that to my cows. And I said, well, I am feeding it to my soil livestock, and they need to be fed just as well as your cows do. <laughs> Yeah, they certainly do, and I can imagine that would be uh, that would be difficult for some farmers to uh, to learn how to do. I had an old old neighbor, old farmer, you know, older than me, probably in his close to his ninety. He stopped in one day and he said, "Zimmer, you're going to wear those soils out. You're constantly growing something." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I said, "Yeah, but I'm putting it back. I'm not taking it all." I think they got the mentality: you plant something, you take it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, We've spoken a couple of times about trace minerals. What is the optimal way to apply trace minerals from your perspective to get the greatest crop response? Yes. So what my whole thing is good, because we're putting on in such small amounts. First, we got to look at sources. We got our oxides, our sulfates, our chelates, and then we got them mixed with other things. And so see trace minerals in such a small amount to put a pound of zinc oxide, or zinc oxide, I'm not sure what I get out of that. Let's just take a better source like sulfate. I put a pound to the acre. I got one little crystal of zinc sulfate per square foot. Now that's for measurements actually, but it's kind of crazy. So then I said, if I would, if I did a homogenized blend and I took my array of trace metals, let's say it's zinc, manganese, iron, copper, boron, and we do it in a base of natural rock materials where there's other minerals like there's nickel, there's silica, there's all kinds of other things that are in that source. And then we add humates and we homogenize on. So that whole mix, every BB's got the same analysis. Now, if I put on 25 pounds of that per acre, I got the same one pound of zinc, let's say. But now I got it distributed out here. So I got 50 of those in that square foot. And I've already got them hooked to a carbon. So my chances of having them just tied up and gone, I got better distribution. Because see, now when I grow my next crop, I want to make sure... Some people say, well, I, I tested my next crop and the level isn't any higher in my next my crop. Sometimes they forget the fact that we've just increased their yield also. Some pounds per acre removed might have gone up. But then uh, in that next crop, see, now I got those minerals distributed in the stalks and the residues. And as this whole cycle keeps going round and round, I, over time, I just keep building those numbers up, cycling through carbon. There's all these levels of minerals have moved up also. If I'm going to remove all those, and of course I'm going to have some issues. So then, so my whole thing about is uh, uh, these homogenized blends have been something I've been working on for 30 years, and then it's about putting them in that base of carbon, and we also try to control the pH. We want to make sure the pH is a little low in that mix. So around each little BB, we can keep those analysis higher because we're trying to get them exchangeable. Gary, I, this this is a fascinating topic for me, and um, I'd like to get a little bit of context and background to some of the work that we've done. So we started using SAP analysis to measure the trace mineral absorption and nutrient absorption of what crops are actually absorbing. So the SAP analysis, we measure 22 different parameters and it is extremely sensitive and very accurate. It shows very quickly what's happening and what's going on. And we, when we put on an application that the plants actually absorb, the needle moves very quickly. Mm -hmm. So about 2012 or 13, somewhere in there, we're working in southeastern Pennsylvania where there's calcareous soils, limestone-based soils with pHs of 7.2, 7.4, sometimes higher. And there's challenges with chronic manganese deficiencies. Historically, growers have been applying manganese sulfate as a dry soil broadcast or even as a foliar spray. And we thought we were getting crop responses when we were using tissue analysis. We would, we would see the tissue analysis levels increase. When we started using sap analysis, all of a sudden we realized that even the manganese sulfate foliar sprays were not being absorbed effectively. They were still on the outside of the leaf, but they weren't actually being absorbed. As a result of that, several different growers that we were working with out there, we did experiments where they, uh, we blended manganese sulfate in with humified compost and we applied it at on different plots of rates of 20 pounds, 40 pounds, 100 pounds, 200, and 400 pounds per acre of manganese sulfate. Small plots on an experimental basis to observe the plant response. How much do you think the manganese increased on those small plots, even where we applied 400 pounds per acre? I got a feeling it wasn't probably as greatly different as one would think. Not a single point. There was no manganese absorption from the applied manganese to the soil. 
when it was applied with compost. We measured plant absorption for three years after the application, and there was not on a single crop was there an actual crop response or plant absorption. And uh, I have a, a couple of ideas of why that is and why that was going on, uh, but I, I'd like to ask you the question, um, your, your carbon-based fertilizers and your homogenous blends, you, you mentioned a couple of different pieces that I think are important. How are those different from what I described, and how are you able to get those plant responses? Right. So now you use the humified compost to put them in, and uh, we tried to put them to a sponge that would hold on to them. I think here's the whole thing. Let's go back to even the testing on trace minerals. And I think uh, your, some of your comments that came through loud, you're like foliar feeding manganese and then doing a tissue test. Yes, it might come up because it's on the outside. You just put it there. It all got washed off. But my whole thing is this, that every soil and every biology and every tillage and every farm is kind of different on how they see and perceive things. Your soil has a certain ability to dish out minerals. And so then if we dump down three, 400 pounds an acre, there's interactions and there's other things happening. So now you've got that mineral in the soil. It tied up with something that went somewhere, but did not necessarily go into the plant. Was that a good or a bad thing? Now, if we go to soil testing, manganese is one that I'm most critical of, but soil testing, these things are just giving us a little bit of clues. And maybe your sap analysis is more accurate. My thing on the sap analysis, and I'll let you address it here in a bit is that you got to do it on a lot of bases because the weather changes, the day changes, the plant maturity changes, there's interactions of how long ago I put my fertilizers on and all these other things. But manganese is, a, is one of those minerals that, to me, is a biological mineral. Because we're dairy people, we're constantly testing our feeds. Our feeds are more than double in manganese. So it's more than double in my feeds than what average feed would have, like alfalfa for a dairy cow. And, of course, years ago, I would tell people that's why my father fed oats to cows. He didn't understand, but oats are a good source of manganese because they're a fairly acidic plant, and they can take out manganese where others can't. So then that gets in that oats. So that manganese is double in our feeds, but my soil test, if I set it in, it says it's low in manganese. Now, putting on more doesn't necessarily drive up more. So I tell people that's why you do have to really look at the plants because we're testing a lot of feed for our cows. So manganese on the chemistry extraction from a soil shows low. And it might be not, maybe I don't have a big reserve out there. Now, we'll add a small amount every year because that gives more an, than what my soil can dish out. But because there's a biological link and really strong, I think, on both phosphorus and manganese and maybe some others, that oh, I get a huge uptake of manganese in the plant. So that's really what I'm after because that's one of the signs to me. That's one way to measure good biological activity is by watching manganese. I, I couldn't agree more. When you said that manganese is a biological mineral, it's one of the things that we've observed is that manganese and phosphorus and iron as well, cobalt, copper, mm -hmm. the quantity that is absorbed by the plant is in direct correlation to the level of biological integrity and biological soil health. Biology trumps chemistry. You can have really screwed up chemistry in the soil, and as long as you have good biology, you can overcome that to some degree. Yeah. But the opposite doesn't seem to be true. And that's why I think if you look at research out here, now your little plots here are using humified compost, which would have been some biological food and things, but uh, what was the biological activity and balance within those soils? And that's when you go to university research, you've got to go to their farms and look around. If their soils are really dead with, and yours are not, and you're a farmer and you're just down the road and yours got a different biologic and you're growing different varieties of crops and cover crops and you're doing some really positive things out there, not using all these negative inhibitors and pesticides that go on and on the list goes, just because uh, they did the research at their farm doesn't necessarily help you. <laughs> That's very true. Gary, why use trace minerals? Why the emphasis on manganese and, and zinc and boron and all these various trace minerals? What do they do for you from a crop quality and health perspective? So uh, I'll back up and say that just a little bit, because when we were talking about nitrogen, see, when we added the sugars or the molasses to the nitrogen, we were trading dollars. We took some of the nitrogen away and we put some carbon with it. When we're taking our insecticides or our fungicides, we trade dollars on nitrogen. We trade dollars on a phosphorus starter fertilizer. We take some of that out and we put our sugars in its place. When we go to add in these trace minerals in today's world of economy, we just added a cost. They are not cheap. And if you go out to buy them, they're very expensive. So now to a farmer, I got to live within their budget. So how do I shuffle dollars out of the farmer? Or I'm going to have to expect a huge increase in yield when I think another really hard message to get across to farmers is the fact that plant health 
is really related to our balance of minerals and trace minerals are huge for fungal diseases and insect pressures. And on our farm, we live right in an area, we've never seen the need for an insecticide. There's a lot of corn dying from fungal diseases out here. We see very little activity of that on our farm. So part of that is the excess nitrogen you suck up in that plant. And I'm sure you a lot of time probably more and I have studied that looking at this DHs and where, where the fungal disease is set up but trace minerals are huge and we've got a lot of evidence from farms and we actually did some research at the University of Wisconsin on corn and we put our homogenized trace minerals on there and just testing the trace minerals well they put it on a field where they didn't use any biotechnology because they thought we didn't want to use it which we don't but uh, the corn was just diseased and brown and we had a huge response from just a small amount of trace minerals added because we really stopped the diseases. So for a farmer, they've got to recognize that as we get this because of health and benefits and enzymes and where the trace minerals fit in there, all those regulatory things within a plant that actually promote health, stimulate its immune system, stimulate its, its ability to protect itself, I guess we'd want to say. So when you start spending money on trace minerals, you should be able to take the money away from insecticides, fungicides, pesticides, and biotechnology to pay for it. But you can't say that to a farmer right up front because he has to earn the right to do that. That should be his goal. I was at a huge uh, um, Hutterite colony in South Dakota last week. They dropped all their insecticides. Now they're growing huge cover crops. They got livestock involved. They're doing better balanced fertility. And they've cut their nitrogens way down. They've taken their soybean yields up by over 20 bushel on just 20 inches of rain. I One soybean plant with 508 pods on it. It's unbelievable. because Their biology has really changed. They dropped all their biotechnology and they're slowly getting rid of all the chemistry. So all that money now, I can make up by buying nutrition, not only to make my livestock and things better, make my soils better in the future. So that's the hard one to be able to stay within the farmer's budget with today's economy because that that takes time and we just can't say, look, drop all your biotechnology and secondary fungicides and put our trace rules on because I don't know, maybe your experiences are different, but this doesn't always work 100% that way. I think that's one of the strengths that we've observed with SAP analysis is that, yes, we do have to be on top of it and manage it like you have to manage a dairy ration. You have to measure constantly throughout the growing season, but you can actually be very accurate and predict what's happening and what's going on. We have had successes uh, quite consistently in the first year when we start working with a grower. And we've done a lot of work in Southwest Kansas, working with commodity crops, corn and soybeans in these very hot, dry environments with both irrigated and dry land corn. And one of the things that we've observed with trace minerals, when growers begin applying trace minerals, the great majority of the time, uh, we cut out the miticide applications. Well, when you're talking a miticide application that costs $40 an acre and you apply it once or twice, all of a sudden you can afford trace minerals really easily. Yes. And I agree. Now, we got to whether I put those trace minerals, we did a lot of work. I think that's done quite a bit over in Australia where they put all these trace minerals in their compost pile. They put a lot of minerals and things in their compost. Well, hopefully that can really work. There's all kinds of ways to do it. We also got to recognize that health and insect pressure also gets a little bit, how do we prevent diseases? Phosphorus uptake is huge. We got to get high levels of phosphorus uptake. We got to make sure we got a nitrogen to sulfur ratios in line. We got to make sure we got adequate levels of calcium uptake. And we got to have these ratios between those minerals. If you have really high potassium levels and low magnesium, all those things stress a plant. So the trace minerals are a piece of it, but there's more pieces to the puzzle. That's why this is a system and we have to put that whole system in place. When you do your SAP test to do this kind of thing, are you doing it at critical or certain stages throughout the season? Is that your approach? Yes, we're doing it at critical stages. And uh, if we're doing it for research to... Uh, or in field research to try to get an understanding of what is happening with that crop throughout the entire season. We'll do it once every 14 days, and that can be incredibly revealing. You learn an awful lot about a crop and a soil system and how it's really functioning and how you can manage it better in the future. If you do that just for one year on one crop, yeah. you'll, you'll learn a lot about what's really happening on your farm. That makes perfect sense. And that, to me, I think the farmers right now are kind of down in the mouth and understandable and kind of bummed out. How do I pay my bills? I think the fun and excitement in farming is doing some of the things you're talking about and some of the things I'm talking about here is, is to get back and take charge of their farm. Otherwise, I think they feel like they're just kind of a, a slave to agribusiness out here and they got all the fancy new stuff. But the fun in farming is to getting this whole thing to work. And that's the part they kind of probably miss. Yeah. So, Gary, one of the conversations that we've been kind of circling around all these pieces when we spoke about nitrogen management and carbon and nitrogen and carbon-based fertilizers is the importance of biology 
importance of having manganese and phosphorus delivered by biology. How do we regenerate soil microbial communities after they've been severely compromised by challenging farm management practices, et cetera? Yeah, and that was why I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, see, that's when we take on land, we just took on some more land, another 300 acres, and we're transitioning. I want to tell you, it was pretty dead. <laughs> it was in pretty bad shape and not been fertilized very well, been rented for numbers and numbers of years, and everybody took whatever they could with putting a little back they possibly could. So, yes, we did re We and maybe it's not capable of everybody to do this. First, I'll say the organic guys, I think this is just such a beautiful two-year period of time. And everybody says, how can you afford to do that? And I said, how can you afford not to do that? Because they yield. So we go out and take our soil test, and we always start with calcium and phosphorus, drive our calcium and phosphorus levels, make sure they're in line. And then we start doing these cover crops, shallow incorporating them, and we just kept feeding the soil. Yes, I'd like to be able to put on compost, and yes, I'd love to have some livestock manure if it's available. I do like my dairy manure. If you look in the world of biologicals, a lot of them are extracted from cattle paunch material, certain biologies and certain chemistries, because that's a pre-digestion going on, which you're not going to necessarily get out of chicken manure or hog manure. That old fermentation vat within a cow does some other wonderful things. These digestate stuff, because we use a lot of uh, manure coming out of anaerobic digestion on dairy farms as our base for our fertilizers. So all these little things to regenerate that soil, would I go out there and spray a biology or a bug? Uh, I haven't, and I don't. And I know there's a lot of people selling bugs in a jug out here, and, and maybe they have their place, and maybe there's some special, unique ones. But me, I want to change that whole system. So for organic, then I got those two years and put everything back in the soil. So then when it is certified organic, I hit a home run the first year. I mean, it just unbelievable. We grow some seed corn out here. You know, we can get our 200 bushel corn that first year at $10 a bushel. covers all my losses during those two years. And you also got to recognize that 300 acres, <clears throat> taking on 300 acres, we farm 1,500. It's not our whole farm. We're not sacrificing our whole farm. They're, oh, it's a big cost. Don't get me wrong. But next year, that's organic. It's kind of all exciting because we get a high return for a couple of years of, of uh, high paid crops. We rent that land that we fix, and the landlords, the owners, they are just in shock of what we do. But I do get a seven-year rent of two years to transition it and five years to farm it. We've never lost a piece of land yet that we've taken on because they like what we do to it and how we change that thing. So now let's go to a guy that corn beans, corn beans, and chemistry. <sighs> it's a real struggle because where do cover crops even fit in? They have to be kind of committed. Uh, I maybe can bring on some compost or some livestock. But I need to get so I don't have so much bare soil and a more of a fibrous root system. I need to get plants and food out there. Can I do that all with compost? I can make progress. But until I get, uh, whether it be another crop or these guys down in Illinois, if they, I see they're, everybody's out of rye. The rye is all gone, the rye seed, so more people are doing it. And rye is the only thing that you can plant late. It's not everybody's favorite thing. But how do I fit that in? Uh, us organic guys to intercede corn with a cover crop really doesn't work very well because we plant later and because we make a cultivation when the corn is knee high. If I planted my corn earlier and when it's six, eight inches tall, now hopefully I, my chemical herbicides won't interfere with it, I would then drill my cover crop in between the rows to get it established early May. Us organic guys, that would be mid-June and it's so hot and dry, but then the cover crops don't, don't make it and the corn's too big and it shades it out. I got to be committed to have a diversity of plants and something to recycle those nutrients and something for that biology to live on. Otherwise, bugs in a jug. I was out in Dakota. These guys seem to be happy with $20 an acre worth of bugs in a jug. I said, you're not going to ever get away from this. This is an addiction that now you're spending $20 an acre on for the rest of your life because you're not doing anything to have them grow on their own. Yeah, our experience has been we, we use microbial inoculants. We've seen a lot of successes with them with one qualification. Biology mm -hmm. still needs a food source. And I think everything that you're talking about, cover crops and developing this whole system, is all about developing the soluble carbon in the soil profile they can use as a food source. The food source is the biggest limiting factor. It's not oxygen. It's not water. It's food. It's food. On a lot of farms. And um, I think that's the, the piece that you're really talking about is adding microbial inoculants and uh, bugs in a jug and adding all these pieces. It's a, it's a temporary fix. You, you have to fix the entire system so that that population desires to live there on its own. Yep. And you can make progress on a farm on soil health by just like right behind that combine to spray on, like you said, a biological. That's a more of a, a fungal kind of because you've got a complex carbon, old dead corn stalks and a little bit of nitrogen and some biology and a little bit. You can really improve that digestion and you can help to start improve your soils. But that's 
really just a small piece because you still have one food source that's complex carbons. I don't have enough soluble carbons. Now, that's why, see, Michigan State years ago did research on interseeding that corn, and 8 out of 10 or 6 out of 10 years having that cover crop going in their corn improved their yields of corn. And everybody said, how is that possible? I said, because that thing is photosynthesizing and putting its exudates down in the soil to feed the biology. The biology feeds the plants. And so I can get those sugars, and maybe some of our humus has built out of those sugars. So you, you think, well, I'm robbing moisture and I'm robbing nutrients, but you're giving back because the plants give back a fair bit into the soil to make this work. Because how else do I get these soluble carbohydrates to work within my soil? Yeah, exactly. Which reminds me of something. I had some experiences recently that reminded me of a Gary Zimmer quote that I heard many, many years ago. Something to the effect that we generally tend to misdiagnose what is actually happening, what's actually going on. Can you refresh my memory on uh, what that quote was? Oh, gosh. Yes, I... 50% of the time, I said, when we see and observe something, we give the credit to the wrong thing and we blame the wrong thing. 50% of the time. I don't care who you are, a researcher, a scientist. So you got to always take that with a grain of salt because your observation, they might have a, it's got a chain reaction that took place way a long time before that. 50% of the time. That's a really big, that's a big proportion of the time. That's a big proportion of the times. I, what I always want people to not to get hung up on one little piece of research. I want them to focus on a system and all those things that can be taken with a grain of salt. And yes, there's tools out here today and understandings we never had years ago. I said, my grandfather wasn't a biological farmer. He didn't understand. He was in battle with weeds. He didn't understand fertility and all these little, he didn't understand, you know, why he plowed. And, you know, he was certainly wasn't using a lot of harsh chemistries, but he was not necessarily doing all good things for his soil either because they were always in battle with something. Yeah, we've come a long ways. We've learned a lot of things in the last couple of decades. Yes. And I was at a meeting in Illinois, right down by Peoria, Illinois, in the heart of corn and bean ground, that $12,000 an acre black soils that I don't know how they're going to pay for them at 10% interest when it gets there. But anyway, another story. <laughs> and, uh, uh, down those beautiful, rich black soils in the meeting, there was there was at a farm, and it was kind of they were at least eight biological companies selling their bugs in a jug, and not a single one. They just wanted you to buy their bugs and spray them out. Not a single one was ever talking about a system. Because I had you know me on, and I was joking and teasing around, and I said, "All you guys, if you're going to go buy those bugs in a jug, maybe you ought to talk to us first and set the conditions up so they have a chance of making it." <laughs> I can imagine Gary doing that very well because I am. I remember, I recall Gary giving me a hard time years ago. No, <laughs> <laughs> I would have done that, John. I like to, <laughs> I like to challenge people's thinking, and sometimes you got to be uh, uh, rattled a little bit. I'm, I've earned the right to do that because, see, I've been around a long time. Absolutely, Gary. What other what other topics are important for us to talk about? Well, I think we covered uh, on this nitrogen thing, which brought on a lot of this carbon-based fertilizer kind of a thing and these sources of nutrients and when and how we add them. And uh, I tell people out here, we got this uh, other movement going on in agriculture that, you know, this, this regenerative thing where they absolutely think that, uh, you know, you don't really need fertilizers. You got a, you got enough reserve in the soil, you can pull them back out. And I think you and I both know there's certain nutrients like sulfur and available calcium and boron that might not work real well without ever adding them because they're anions and they leach. But I think we, we get uh, distorted views. Now, that system I kind of find really interesting because they say you got to no-till and you got to have livestock. Because if you no-till and you got all these residues out here that uh, someone's got to break and digest them down so they graze them in the wintertime. Well, they're in a place in the Dakotas where they get 20 inches of rain. Now let's go where you get 40 inches of rain. There's a neighbor of ours that started to graze cattle. We had this 10 inches of rain two weeks ago. He never took them off the pastures. How long do you think this is going to work? So we always got these different systems out here. And so I think some of the topics we covered is how this management fits in it and how they got to treat that soil as this living live entity and make sure that would you leave your cows out on a pasture for several days when it just rained 10 inches? Or would you lock them up off that field and give that chance? For that? They destroyed that field for a long time, in my opinion. So that management part of it, they got to really understand this and said, how do they put this management end together on that farm? And they got to be able to understand where they're going. I think just like I said, they, they just automatically think that diseases show up. Oh, the population of bugs in the county are really high this week. I was over in England at a conference and they developed a meter that you can put on the corner of your farm. And when the spore levels get so high on certain fungal diseases, they want you to go out and spray 
And now, you know, I'm, I'm at the conference. I just couldn't keep quiet. I stood up and said, I just came over on a plane. If one of those sat in the corner of the plane, I'm pretty sure I'd be on antibiotics today. And yet I have an immune system and I don't take antibiotics unless I absolutely need to. And I'm not sick today. And so everybody laughed kind of because uh, it just seems like how do we get them to understand that this system was designed to work and when everything is in this little place, we should have healthy, high producing crops without having to spend all our money on plant protective things that never make my farm better and they have terrible side effects. How do we get that little discussion is the one that there's a certain topics that are really hard to get through people's head. Like we talked about nitrogen numbers and credits, understanding that health is something you can achieve without putting an insecticide or fungus on just because spores are near, it doesn't need to use it. There's certain things they got to believe and understand and yet There'll be bumps and obstacles in the road, and they can use those tools if needed, but they don't have to depend upon them. I think what's exciting about agriculture is there's so much pressure being put on the chemistry companies, whether it's Bayer or Monsanto or whoever it is. All these different companies are coming out with a huge amount of uh, more safer control agents, whether they be for fungal diseases or for insects or whether they be for whatever, I think they're coming out with safer kind of things to be able to handle and put on our land. Now, herbicides are a really big battle out here. Uh, people are having much, much stronger, harsher herbicides. Those weeds want to survive on this planet also, and they're going to come back against us no matter what we do. So we better learn how to live with them in a system. Mother Nature always bats last, and she always wins. <laughs> I know. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> it's always designed to get rid of the sick and the undesirable, too. So if you got a disease out there, what's the reason for the disease? It must be sick and undesirable. Exactly. Gary, it's been a pleasure having you here. I've really enjoyed this conversation and found it very delightful, and I'm sure that our audience will as well. So thank you very much for sharing, and uh, I look forward to more conversations in the future. No, oh, real pleasure, and I wish you well in all your endeavors. All you young guys are the ones that got to take over and change agriculture. I've done all my things. I'm getting up there and long in the tooth, as they say. So I've been around in a while, but I sure enjoy all your knowledge and all the work you guys do out here that are anybody that's even listening to this podcast to say, I know it might not be easy, but it is the right path. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, Gary. This podcast was brought to you by a great company that I work for, AEA, Advancing Eco Agriculture, the leader in regenerative agriculture since 2006. At AEA, we believe in challenging the status quo to find more profitable and regenerative ways to grow crops. We also believe that healthy plants are resistant to pest and disease and that to grow healthy crops, we must first think different about agriculture, about empowering life, instead of suppressing life, about regeneration versus degeneration. To achieve this, we formulate and sell products that help growers produce higher quality yield with less risk of crop failure. In short, we help growers make more money with less risk. Thanks for listening.